Chapter Two, Part One of Chronicles of Crime and Criminals, Number One, by Beaver Publishing Company. Full and authentic account of the Whitechapel murders. Never in the record of criminal history were the police of any country called upon to unravel a mystery so complete as that which enshrouds the famous murders in Whitechapel, London. Nine victims have fallen under the skillful knife of an unknown fiend, and there remains not a particle of a clue on which to hang a hope of discovery of the murderer. From beginning to end, the tragedies have been marked by many circumstances and mysterious details, which fill all with horror and dismay. The clubman in his club, the lady in her boudoir, the housewife in her kitchen, the working girl in the shop and factory, the whispering gin-soaked public woman on the thoroughfare, alike were stirred by these dreadful tidings of heartless and bloody crime. The government of Her Majesty was questioned about them in open Parliament. The detectives of Scotland Yard put their heads together, plotted, schemed, devised, but all to no purpose. The ensanguined book of dastardly murder is a sealed book. One after the other, the mutilated victims of this mysterious demon were picked up on the highways of a great city, but no one has seen the murderer. No one suspects who he is, and no one has found him. A great wave of nervous, feverish alarm and terror swept over the metropolis of Great Britain. In every case, the unmistakable work of the same fiend was too painfully apparent to admit, of a doubt, that these murders in Whitechapel were wrought by one fell hand. Madman he probably was, but with all his boldness he possessed a cruel cunning which allowed him to stalk abroad on the public streets, striking down his victims as he pleased, leaving not the faintest clue to his personality. No conception can be formed of the motives of his horrible crimes, unless it is reasonable to suppose it was the work of a maniac. Did the fiend experiment on the corpses for anatomical purposes? Did he seek revenge on the class of public women because some injury he had himself received from one of them? Was he a madman, irresponsible, bloodthirsty, craving, supernatural excitements? These are some of the questions that may resolve themselves when you have read a detailed account of these murders perpetuated in one of the oldest and presumably one of the most civilized cities in the modern world. The first of the Whitechapel murder series attracted little public attention. It was perpetrated on April 3, 1888. The victim was Emma Elizabeth Smith. As the policeman stooped over her, looked into her bloodless face, in the light of bullseye, gazed into her blear eyes, smelt her gin-soaked breath, examined her blood-stained clothes. He reported the case to headquarters. The officials did not bother much about it. Only a woman of the lowest class, they thought, murdered in a drunken brawl. What else can you expect in Whitechapel, with its floating population of criminals and fallen women? The press commented a little on the incident. The clubman yawned after he read about it at his supper. The fine lady remarked it was shocking as she buttered her muffins at breakfast, and then the disagreeable subject was dismissed. Martha Turner was a poor hawker in Whitechapel. On Tuesday, August 7, 1888, this Martha Turner was found lying on her back, her clothing disarrayed, on the first floor landing of the buildings known as George Yard Buildings, Commercial Street, Spitalfields, Whitechapel. Her throat was cut, her breasts were amputated and laid beside her, her legs were lacerated with knife gashes, and the blood stained the floor with clotted red. The day previous to the second murder had been what is known as Bank Holiday, and it was late in the evening that day that the murder had been perpetrated. Martha Turner had evidently met her fate by the same hand that struck down Emma Elizabeth Smith. The same mutilation of the same parts was visible. The same rapid work was traceable in the assassin's onslaught. As nearly as the police could determine, both women had been seized suddenly, unexpectedly, by a powerful arm from behind, and their throats cut swiftly by the rapid stroke of a razor-edged knife. 
Such was the force of the murderer's death blow, and such the keenness of his devilish weapon, that the head was almost severed from the body, hung loose, and the knife had left its imprint upon the bone at the back of the neck. But more remarkable than the ghastly work at the throat was the discovery that the woman had received no less than thirty-nine distinct, deep and clear cut stabs upon various parts of her body. From these wounds the blood had poured forth, saturating her clothes and covering the steps on which she lay with a slippery coating of coagulated blood. Examination of the body revealed the same horrible, indescribable mutilation of the uterus that had marked the first murder. The underclothing of coarse material had been thrown roughly up over the victim's head, and a jagged wound crossed the bowels, laying bare the intestines. Below this, a portion of the woman's body had been cut out with the nicety and skill of a surgeon's knife, leaving only a blood-oozing and quivering aperture. The organ had been removed, as in the case of the first murder. Horror seized the police authorities on seeing this sight. Several friends of the victim were arrested and held by the coroner, but little was found that cast light on the crime. At the inquest, Mary Ann Connolly, known in Whitechapel as Pearly Paul, was a witness who was expected to give valuable information. Inspector Reed asked that she might be cautioned prior to being sworn, and the coroner complied with this request. I am a single woman, testified Pearly Paul. I've been lodging in a lodging house in Dorset Street. I have gained my livelihood on the streets. I've known the murdered woman for four or five months. We called her Emma. The last time I saw her alive was on bank holiday at the corner of George Yard, Whitechapel. We went to a public house together and parted at 11.45. We were accompanied by two soldiers, one a private and one a corporal. I don't know to what regiment they belonged, but they had little white bands around their caps. I don't remember whether the corporal had sidearms or not. We picked up with the soldiers together and entered several public houses. We drank at each of the houses. When we separated, Emma went away with the private. They went up to George Yard, and I and my fellow went to Angel Alley. Before I went away from my fellow, I had a quarrel, and he hit me with a stick. I didn't hear Emma have a quarrel. I never saw her alive again. Emma wasn't given to drink. I tried to pick out the two men who were with us. I tried at Wellington Barracks. The men were paraded before me, but though I saw two men, something like those who were with us on the night of the murder, I couldn't be sure. I left my fellow, the corporal, at five or ten minutes past twelve that morning, and afterwards went along Commercial Street towards Whitechapel. I didn't hear no screams. I didn't hear of the murder till Tuesday. Pearly Paul was the only witness who could give any news at all about Martha Turner, and that news, as you see, was scant enough. The authorities were baffled. The public was beginning to be aroused. Scarcely had aristocratic West End of London recovered from the second murder in low-life East End when the city and the world were cast into new spasms by the flash of news that a third crime had been committed in the cursed, crime-stained precincts of Whitechapel. Everybody asked, Who is it? and the answer came swifter than death. Another woman! This time it was Marianne Nichols, aged forty-two, a woman of the lowest class. She had been killed and mutilated. Her body was found in the street in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, in the early morning of Friday, August 31st. Marianne Nichols had evidently not been killed on the spot where her body lay dead. She had evidently been killed at another spot and dragged to where she lay. There was little blood around the corpse. Bucks Row is a short street, half occupied by factories, half by dwelling houses. Half down this street is the house of Mrs. Green. Next to this house is a large stable yard, whose wide, closed gateway is next to the house. In front of the gateway, Mary Ann Nichols was found. The brutality of the murder is beyond conception and beyond description. The throat was cut in two gashes. 
the instrument of crime having been a sharp one, but used in a most ferocious and reckless way. There was a gash under the left ear, reaching nearly to the center of the throat. Along half its length, however, it was accompanied by another one, which reached around under the other ear, making a wide and horrible hole, and nearly severing the head from the body. No murder was ever more ferociously or more brutally done. The knife, which must have been a large and sharp one, was jabbed into the deceased at the lower part of the abdomen, and then drawn upward twice. A sickening sight, truly, such as unmanned the most hardened official. Constable O'Neill, who discovered the lifeless body, immediately rapped at the house of Mrs. Green. "'Have you heard any unusual noise?' he asked, wiping the perspiration from his brow. Then he pointed out the body. Mrs. Green almost fainted when she saw the ghastly spectacle. Constable O'Neill put his hand on the woman's shoulder and repeated the question. Mrs. Green, as though demented, shook her head in the negative. Then Constable O'Neill questioned the son and daughter of Mrs. Green. "'We have heard no outcry,' said they. "'The night was unusually quiet,' said Mrs. Green finally. "'I should have heard a noise, if there had been any, for I have trouble with my heart and am a very light sleeper.' Then Constable O'Neill questioned Mr. Perkins, an opposite neighbor to the Greens, but he also denied having heard a noise in the still air of night. Several people, however, remembered strange sounds. "'I was awakened Friday morning,' testified Mrs. Perkins, a neighbor, "'by my little girl who said someone was trying to get into the house. I listened and heard screams. They were in a woman's voice, and though frightened, were faint-like.' as would be natural if she was running. She was screaming, Murder! Police! Murder! She seemed to be all alone. I think I would have heard the steps if anybody had been running after her, unless he were running on tiptoe. The detectives of Scotland Yard, thoroughly aroused by this third murder, at once searched everywhere in the vicinity, in the hope of discovering some clue. None was found. Everything pointed to the fact that the murder was committed at some distance from where the body lay. There were drops of blood all along the sidewalks. But there was a mystery even here. The police were puzzled by the fact that there were bloodstains on both sides of the street. Amid a gaping, terror-stricken crowd, the blood-clotted body of Marianne Nichols was lifted on a stretcher and conveyed to the death house. A cordon of police had to keep the crowd back. It took some time to identify her positively. The clothing wore a workhouse stamp. A comb and a piece of looking-glass were found in one of the pockets. Finally, four women identified her, said they knew her by the name of Polly. "'We have lived with her at 18 Thrall Street, Spitalfields,' said they. "'We lived there in a room. We paid four pence a night.' On the night of the murder, it appears Mary Ann Nichols, alias Polly, was turned out of this house because she hadn't money to pay for her lodgings. She was then a little the worse for drink and said, as she was turned away, I'll soon get my DOS money. See what a jolly bonnet I've got now. The lodging house people only knew her as Polly, but later a woman from Lambeth Workhouse identified her as Mary Ann Nichols. The deceased woman had been an inmate of the workhouse and left it to take a situation as a servant but after a short time she absconded with three pounds of her employer's money. From that time forth she was an outcast. The police theory was, at the time, that a sort of high-rip gang existed in the neighborhood, which blackmailing women of the unfortunate class takes vengeance on those who do not find money for them. They base that surmise on the fact that within twelve months Two other women have been murdered in the district by almost similar means, one as recently as the 6th of August last, and left in the gutter of the street in the early hours of the morning. At the coroner's inquest, no testimony was adduced that tended to cast any light on the horrible mystery. The deceased woman's husband, who was a printer's machinist, testified that he had lived apart from his wife for over eight years and the last time he saw her alive was three years ago. 
His wife had left him of her own accord, and her drinking habits had led her into a dissolute life. A week after the killing of Marianne Nichols, another fallen woman, Annie Chapman, age 45, was found killed and hacked like the rest, this making the fourth murder. Her body was discovered in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. John Davies, living on top floor of 29 Hanbury Street, stumbled across it on the morning of Friday, August 31st, and yelled for the police. At a spot a very few hundred yards from where the mangled body of the poor woman, Nichols, was found just a week before, lay this body of another woman, mutilated and horribly disfigured. She was found at 5.30 on Sunday morning, lying in the backyard of No. 20 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, a house occupied by Mr. Richardson, a packing case-maker. As late as five o'clock on Saturday morning, it is said, the woman was drinking in a public house near at hand, called the Ten Bells. Near the body was discovered a rough piece of iron sharpened like a knife. The wounds upon the poor woman were more fearful than those found upon the body of the woman Nichols, who was buried on Thursday. The throat was cut in a most horrible manner, and the stomach terribly mutilated. The bowels were ripped open. The intestines hung out. The place was a pool of blood. While Davies cried for the police, Mrs. Richardson, an old lady sleeping on the first floor front, was aroused by her grandson, Charles Cooksley, who looked out of one of the back windows and screamed that there was a dead body on the corner. Mrs. Richardson's description makes this murder even more horrible than any of its predecessors. The victim was lying on her back, with her legs outstretched. Her throat was cut from ear to ear. Her clothes were pushed up above her waist and her legs bare. The abdomen was exposed, the woman having been ripped up from groin to breastbone, as in the preceding cases. Not only this, but the viscera had been pulled out and scattered in all directions, the heart and liver being placed behind her head, and the remainder along her side. No more horrible sight ever met a human eye, for she was covered with blood and lying in a pool of it. The throat had been cut open in a fearful manner, so deep, in fact, that the murderer, evidently thinking that he had severed the head from the body, tied a handkerchief around it so as to keep it on. There was no blood on the clothes. Hanbury Street is a long street which runs from Baker's Road to Commercial Street. It consists partly of shops and partly of private houses. In the house in question, in the front room on the ground floor, Mr. Harderman carries on the business of a seller of cat's meat. At the back of the premises are those of Mr. Richardson, who is a packing case maker. The other occupants of the house are lodgers. One of the lodgers, named Robert Thompson, who is a carman, went out of the house at 3.30 in the morning, but heard no noise. Two girls, who also live in the house, were talking in the passage until 12.30 with young men, and it is believed that they were the last occupants of the house to retire to rest. It seems that the crime was committed soon after five. At that hour, the woman and the man, who in all probability was her murderer, were seen drinking together in the Bells, Brick Lane. But though the murder was committed at this late hour, the murderer, acting, as in the other case, silently and stealthily, managed to make his escape. On the wall, near where the body was found, there was, according to one reporter, discovered written in chalk, five, fifteen more, and then I give myself up. Jack, the Ripper. Davies, the lodger who discovered the body, immediately communicated with the police at the Commercial Street station, and Inspector Chandler and several constables arrived on the scene in a short time, when they found the woman in the condition described. An excited crowd gathered in front of Mrs. Richardson's house, and also around the mortuary in Old Montague Street, to which place the body was quickly removed. Several persons who were lodging in the house and who were seen in the vicinity when the body was found were taken to the Commercial Street station and closely examined, especially the women last with the deceased. 
Inquiries led to the discovery that the woman was known by several names. Her real name was Annie Chapman, but she had latterly passed as Annie Seavey and rejoiced in the nickname of Dark Annie. Her age was about forty-five. She was five feet high, had fair brown wavy hair, blue eyes, and like Marianne Nichols, had two teeth missing. One peculiarity of her features was a large, flat kind of nose. Her clothing was old and dirty, and nothing was found in her pockets except part of an envelope bearing the seal of the Sussex Regiment. For the last nine months she had been sleeping at a lodging house, 35 Dorset Street, Spitalfields, and she was there as recently as two o'clock on Saturday morning eating some potatoes. She had not, however, the money to pay for her bed, and at two o'clock she left with the remark to the keeper of the place, I'll soon be back again. I'll soon get money for my doss. Almost the very words Mary Ann Nichols used to the companion she met in Whitechapel Road at 2.30 on the morning of her death. A companion identified her soon after she had been taken to the mortuary as Dark Annie, and as she came from the mortuary gate, bitterly crying, said between her tears, I knowed her. I kissed her poor cold face. The large, flat kind of nose of the deceased was so striking a peculiarity that the police hoped to be able to fully trace the movements of the deceased by means of it. The clothing of the dead woman, like that of most of her class who ply their trade in this quarter of London, was old and dirty. In the dress of the dead woman, two farthings were found, so brightly polished as to lead to the belief that they were intended to be passed as half-sovereigns, and it is probable that they were given to her by the murderer as an inducement for her to accompany him. Late on Saturday, after the deceased had been formally identified as Annie Seavey, a witness came forward and stated that her real name was Annie Chapman. She came from Windsor and had friends residing at Vox Hall. She had been married, her husband being an army pensioner, who had allowed her ten shillings a week. But he died a twelve-month ago, and the pension ceasing, she became one of the hideous women infesting Whitechapel. She lived for a time with a sieve maker in Dorset Street, and was known to her acquaintances as Annie Seavey, a nickname derived from her paramour's trade. Mrs. Fiddymont, wife of the proprietor of the Prince Albert Public House, better known as the Clean House, at the corner of Brushfield and Stewart Streets, half a mile from the scene of the murder, told police that at seven o'clock on Saturday morning she was standing in the bar talking with another woman, a friend, in the first compartment. Suddenly came into the middle compartment a man whose rough appearance frightened her. He had a brown stiff hat, a dark coat, and no waistcoat. He came in with his hat down over his eyes, and with his face partly concealed, asked for a half pint of ale. She drew the ale, and meanwhile looked at him through the mirror at the back of the bar. As soon as he saw the woman in the other compartment watching him, he turned his back, and got the partition between himself and her. The thing that struck Mrs. Fiddymont particularly was the fact that there were blood spots on the back of his right hand. This, taken in connection with his appearance, caused her uneasiness. She also noticed that his shirt was torn. As soon as he had drank the ale, which he swallowed at a gulp, he went out. Her friend went out also to watch the man. Her friend was Mary Chapel, who lives at number 28 Stewart Street, nearby. Her story corroborates Mrs. Fiddymont's. When the man came in, the expression of his eyes caught her attention. His look was so startling and terrifying. It frightened Mrs. Fiddymont so that she requested her to stay. He wore a light blue check shirt, which was torn badly, into rags. In fact, on the right shoulder. There was a narrow streak of blood under his right ear, parallel with the edge of his shirt. There was also dried blood between the fingers of his hand. When he went out, she slipped out the other door and watched him as he went toward Bishopsgate Street. She called Joseph Taylor's attention to him, and he followed him. Taylor is a builder at number 22 Stewart Street, and said that as soon as his attention was attracted to the man, he followed him. 
He walked rapidly and came alongside him, but did not speak to him. The man was rather thin, about five feet eight inches high, and apparently between forty and fifty years of age. He had a shabby, genteel look, pepper and salt trousers, which fitted badly, and dark coat. When Taylor came alongside him, the man glanced at him, and Taylor's description of the look was, His eyes were as wild as a hawk's. Was this man with the sharp eye also the man with the sharp knife? Was he the Whitechapel murderer? Time perhaps will tell. Jack, the Ripper, had got to be a thing of flesh and blood in the households of England. The man of Whitechapel inspired the fear once inspired by Guy Fox. Mothers hushed their unruly children by saying, Be quiet, or Jack the Ripper will come. The police were still at work. The officials of Scotland Yard were more than usually busy. A cordon of constables surrounded Whitechapel. Bloodhounds were called into use and sniffed the dirty pavements. The women of the quarter did without food and drink, dared not venture into the streets. Every man they saw seemed to them the demon. Every man loomed up as Jack the Ripper, the fiend who would be satisfied with no less than fifteen victims. It was on Sunday, September 23rd, a calm, quiet, autumnal day of rest, the churches and cathedrals of England were full of devout worshippers. Suddenly there flashed across the wires that a murder had been committed at Gateshead, near Newcastle-on-Tyne, in the north of England. Again a feeling of apprehension seized all classes. A young woman, disemboweled, mangled, mutilated, unrecognizable, lay cold in death on the roadside. Who did the dastardly deed? Everything pointed to the conclusion that this murder at Gateshead was the fell stroke of Jack the Ripper of Whitechapel, his fifth murder. The epidemic of fear in London now became more horrible than before. The most callous elegance of the West End now became thoroughly alarmed. But Jack the Ripper merely grinned with fiendish glee and kept from the sleuth hounds of the public. He hadn't killed his fifteen yet. On the night of September 30th, the streets of London were echoing with shrieks of murder. Two more unfortunate women had been added to the list of the butchered in Whitechapel, being the sixth and seventh victims. Elizabeth Stride, nicknamed Hippie Lip Annie, 40 years of age, was found murdered in Berner Street at one o'clock in the morning. Her throat was cut, but there was no slashing of the remains. The body was warm when found and the murderer had evidently been frightened away. Now, fifteen minutes after the discovery of the dead body of Hippie Lip Annie, the mutilated body of another victim, a degraded woman of the Whitechapel district named Catherine Eddowes, was found in the northeast corner of Mitre Square. The older portion of London abounds with these cul-de-sacs, inaccessible to wagons, and to be reached only by footpaths through private property. A stranger in London would never think of entering one of them, but the old Londoner knows them well as convenient shortcuts. There were two street lamps in Mitre Square, and they were burning brightly at one o'clock this morning. A large tea house in the square hires a private watchman, and he was on duty last night, with lights blazing from five windows. He is a veteran policeman, and looks like a wide-awake, trustworthy man. Less than two hundred feet from the tea house are three or four dwelling houses, with bedroom windows facing the square, and at least twenty people sleeping in them. The policeman on the beat goes through the square every fifteen minutes throughout the night, searching corners with a dark lantern, and rousing out homeless people who fall asleep on the area railings. The policeman who was on the beat at one o'clock this morning was a stalwart, honest-looking fellow. At one thirty this morning he passed through the square, searching all corners with his lantern, and stopping for at least a half a minute in one particular corner right under the bedroom window of a dwelling house. Everything was silent and dark, except the windows of the tea house, where the watchman was awake, reading. Fifteen minutes afterward the policeman passed the same corner again. This time he found a woman stretched dead upon the pavement in a pool of blood, 
her throat cut, her nose torn from the face, the clothes thrown back over the body, the abdomen gashed into pieces, and the intestines wrenched from the stomach. The policeman started. He ran over to the tea house and hammered on the door. "'What's the matter?' shouted the watchman. "'For God's sake,' said the policeman, "'come out and assist me. Another woman has been ripped open.' Not a sound had the watchman heard. The slumbers of the people in the dwelling houses had not been disturbed. Within fifteen minutes a merciless murder had been committed, and the murderer had disappeared in the darkness without the slightest clue for the police to follow. It was a horrible sight. Every sweep of the assassin's night had been made to tell. It was a woman about forty-five years old, poorly nourished, shabbily dressed, undoubtedly an unfortunate who picked up a living on the streets. In this case, no organs were missing, as in the bodies of the women previously murdered. The cuts on the stomach were almost in the shape of the letter T, the upward cut stretching from the uterus to the breast, and a cross cut slanting from the lower part of the left ribs to the right hip. The deed must have been done with a heavy knife, and by someone skilled in the use of it. No jagged hacking, but clean cuts, scientifically made. Several doctors arrived and examined the body. They found a prodigious quantity of blood, which had flowed chiefly from the throat, but the murderer had so carefully avoided it that not a single footmark could be traced. The body was removed to the mortuary, where a careful post-mortem examination took place. There was a tattoo mark of a figure four on the woman's left forearm. Throngs of noisy men, desolate women, and squalid children surrounded the localities where the murders were committed and the places where the bodies await the coroner. They struggled and fought with each other to gain admittance to the dead house, and the police had to use brute force to drive them back. It was a panic of fear and frenzy that those who witnessed will never forget. Early in the day, people were allowed in the dead house to see the woman found on Burner Street and to try and identify her. As soon as she was identified, the doors were closed to all except persons having business there. Those living in the neighborhood who did get a chance to approach the corpse paraded the streets all day with bloodstains of the victim on their fingers and described the appearance of the body over and over again to all the people who would listen to them. London was now thoroughly alarmed. Sir Charles Warren issued a proclamation. The Lord Mayor offered a big reward for the capture of the murderer. Even the swell in the West End stopped sucking the end of his cane and showed considerable animation over the horror that took place with such startling successive rapidity. Everybody felt that the condition of the lost women in London ought to be investigated. Everybody felt there was much rottenness in the existing state of things. Is it a wonder there are so many degraded women in London? If the West End is full of iniquity and injustice, can you marvel at dissipation and debauch in the East End? London was soon stirred by another sensation. On October 2, 1888, the highly decomposed remains of a woman were found on the site of the projected Metropolitan Opera House on the Thames Embankment. The spot is near Charing Cross, three miles west of Whitechapel. But the state of the body, the gashes, the mutilations, the cuts, the holes in the flesh, proved plainly that the murderer was the old fiend, that this was his eighth victim. He had evidently attacked his victim from behind, cut her throat from ear to ear, dug his knife into her breasts. Then he raised her poor, disheveled clothing, slit the body right and left, and left the intestines exposed in a clotted pool of blood. There had evidently been a hard fight. Spots of gore were splattered all over the pavement. But the victim, in spite of her struggles, had succumbed to the hellish adroitness and diabolical strength of her foul assailant. There she lay in the moonlight, stiff, stark dead, and the murderer escaped. Newsboys hawked about the dreadful news. London, at its breakfast, read of a new tragedy. The calls for the resignation of Sir Charles Warren, chief of Metropolitan Police, already loud, grow louder. 
Old men told the story of crimes in the olden times. Terrible as this eighth murder was, Whitechapel had been the scene of mysterious murders before. Close upon eighty years since it, and indeed the whole country, was startled by the perpetration of a series of most revolting murders, the scene being Ratcliffe Highway. The malefactor, whoever he was, for it was never definitely decided, although there was a case of strong circumstantial evidence, almost amounting to certainty, against an Irish sailor named Williams or Murphy, did not, in these instances, seek out and mark down unfortunate women of the lowest class, but looked for his victims in the persons of respectable tradespeople and their families, slaughtered without mercy every human being within the four walls, sparing not even the defenseless, innocent babe in the cradle. The two distinct crimes, in which seven lives were taken, occurred within the space of a fortnight. The first, the murder of the whole household of the Mars, at number 29 Ratcliffe Highway, soon after midnight of Saturday, December 8, 1811, and the second, a similar massacre of the Williamsons, at number 81, New Gravel Lane, Ratcliffe Highway, between 11 and 12 o'clock on the night of the 19th of the same month. In the first case, four persons in all were the victims of the outrage. They were Mr. and Mrs. Marr, each of whom were under 25 years of age, their infant, four months old, and James Gohan, the apprentice, 14 years of age. The servant girl would doubtless have shared the same fate, but that she had been sent out on an errand, and on her return, having been absent less than twenty minutes, found the house in darkness, and subsequently the bodies were discovered lying in various parts of the ground floor and upon the staircase. Three persons perished in the second case. They were Mr. and Mrs. Williamson, the landlord and landlady of the King's Arms, and their maidservant who was found in like manner at the bottom front of the house. A delirium and panic seized Londoners in general, and those living in the East End especially, as had seldom or never been known before. People barricaded their doors and windows as if in momentary expectation of a siege, and there were some who even died of fright as they heard their shutters or doors tried by persons who, at the worst, were probably meditating nothing more serious than burglary. Nor was the alarm confined to the metropolis. A notion had somehow got abroad that the murderer, whoever he was, had left London, and a state of the wildest terror prevailed all over the country. It is an ill wind that blows nobody good, and those were fine times for locksmiths, ironmongers, carpenters, and the like. Everybody was having new shutters, doors, bolts, bars, and locks. Indeed, the door chain, which upon old doors is so often of tremendous strength and weight, owes its origin to the prevailing alarm which existed. For many months afterward he would be in truth a bold, and his neighbors would say, a rash man who answered a knock at the door or a ring at the bell before peering cautiously through the slit which the chain permitted. Even the caricaturists of the day, ready enough as a rule to seize hold of anything which excited the public mind, seemed to have been too frightened to make capital out of the murders, and the political cartoons which introduced hammers and razors, the instruments with which the crimes were committed, are but one or two. Then, as now, in this particular district, the shopkeepers were in the habit of keeping open until midnight, and later on Saturday, and Mr. Marr, who was described as a man mercer, or a hosier, as the modern term has it, had a few minutes before twelve, his shop still being open, gave his servant Margaret Jewell a one-pound note, instructing her to pay the baker's bill, and to bring in some oysters, which was no doubt a Saturday night, or Sunday morning, to be more accurate, treat after the labors of the week. Margaret went to the baker's, and finding it shut, returned past the shop, which was yet open, and her master was still behind the counter. She then went to get the oysters, but finding the shop shut up also, returned, after a brief absence of twenty minutes in all, finding the shop closed and everything in darkness. Upon knocking she was unable to gain admittance, 
Presently a watchman passed on the other side of the street with a person in charge, and soon after another watchman came up, calling the hour of one, who told her to move on. She explained who she was, and the watchman knocked and rang, and then was joined by a neighbor, who got in through the back and opened the door, when they together entered the house. This was the girl's evidence at the inquest, and at this point she fainted away. A sorry spectacle met their gaze as soon as a light could be procured. There lay the apprentice upon his face on the staircase, with a great hole in his skull where his brains had been knocked out, and with such force had this been done, that portions thereof were bespattered over the walls and ceiling. Mrs. Marr was next found lying on the floor, near the street door, quite dead, her head wounded in a like terrible manner, and Mr. Marr's body, without any sign of life, was discovered behind the counter with exactly similar injuries. The only other occupant of the house, an infant four months old, whose innocence had not been sufficient to protect it, was in its cradle, with its throat cut from ear to ear. Its head lay almost severed from its body. Nothing was missing from the house, although there were one hundred and fifty-two pounds in the cash box, and the ill-fated Mar had nearly five pounds in his pockets. The assassin, whoever he was, had disappeared, leaving behind him a large shipwright mallet, which was covered in blood, weighing two or three pounds, with a handle three feet long, a ripping chisel eighteen inches long, and a wooden mallet about four inches square, with a handle eighteen inches in length. Mr. Murray, the neighbor, stated that at about ten minutes past twelve he heard a noise in Mar's house, like the pushing of a chair, and the watchman said that soon after twelve he had called out that the window was unfastened and had been answered from within. We know it. The girl gave evidence that while she was waiting she heard a child cry, and then someone came downstairs. Prints of blood-stained footsteps of at least two persons were, it was said, discovered in the rear of the premises, and several people were taken up on suspicion, but were discharged. The church wardens of the parish offered a reward of fifty pounds, and this was supplemented by twenty pounds from the Thames Police Office, but nothing came of it. End of chapter 2, part 1